It is quite my honor to introduce Dr. Vitor Abrao. I actually have had the privilege of working with Vitor um, over many years. He's an internationally recognized consultant and actually considered one of the world leaders in sequence stratigraphy in deep water reservoirs. Um, I actually learned a lot from Vitor personally as he was the instructor in uh, many of the courses at ExxonMobil as well. He has a PhD from Rice University with more than 30 years of experience in the oil industry. He worked for both Petrobras and ExxonMobil, evaluating and risking petroleum system elements in 38 sedimentary basins in the seven continents. So he's currently the owner of Abrao, and I know I'm saying that wrong, Vitor, consulting and training in Houston. Uh, it is a globally recognized company for oil and gas consulting, training, career development services and research. Many of you may actually have been a benefit of Vitor's uh, education that he does. Uh, he's an adjunct professor at Rice University and former head of stratigraphy in ExxonMobil. He's also a past president of SEPM. He's the chief editor of SEPM's bestseller, Sequence Stratigraphy of Siliclastic Systems, received the AAPG Jules Bronstein Memorial Award for Best Poster, and was appointed AAPG's inaugural International Distinguished Instructor. Um, that's quite the accolades, which is to be expected of Vitor. So with that, I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen. And it's lovely to see all of your faces out there as well. And I'm going to ask Vitor to start sharing his screen. And off we will go. All right. I'm not sure the closed captioning is going to work. I think my computer is causing an issue with that. Okay. Uh, All right. Off to you, Vitor. So, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's always nice to interact again with uh, our geological society. So, I, I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, we uh, we actually chat about uh, subjects to to discuss, and one that's close to my heart is uh, uh, basically history of uh, six stratigraphy, and uh, uh, where are we now on this? And uh, and and you know after you know 50 years almost of uh, uh, evolution of the ideas and application, uh, where were where are we? And uh, and is that still uh, useful? So we can have a, a conversation about that. So you can see my my slide in full view. Yes, we can see your slide in full view now. Thank you. All right. So uh, just to make a, a long story short. Uh, after the uh, publication of uh, of the APG uh, Memoir 26 in 1977. Uh, when Peter Vale and colleagues proposed uh, seismic stratigraphy, uh, that's how six stratigraphy was born, was through seismic. Sometimes people forget that, and uh, uh, and actually, and actually, that was not uh, 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 in the beginning. That was not a well cited uh, book. It was not selling too well. Uh, was actually in the early 80s uh, that uh, people start to realize the importance. And, uh, and today uh, we have the APG Memoir 26 as the APG bestseller. And, uh, and that was followed by the uh, uh, SCPM, uh, SPM special publication that was publishing in 1988, uh, the, the SCPM, uh, the SP42. And that's the uh, bestseller of SCPM. Uh, so, and that was a moment where uh, seismic stratigraphy became one of the methods within the bigger umbrella of sequence stratigraphy, right? So, but uh, during this time, uh, the ideas evolved, and uh, and the and that actually started in the industry, right? It started in Axon at APR, uh, the ESO Axon Production Research Lab, and. But then from there, I went to the, to the university. So, uh, and then a lot of work has been done. And then there was a few consequences for that. For one thing is we start to understand the mechanisms much better. But the other thing that happened was a, prolifer a proliferation of uh, names, right? So today we live in a nomenclature a nightmare. <laughs> and uh, what they scare a lot of people away from six stratigraphy. Uh, and, uh, and also, 
make us forget what the, what was the original intent of six stratigraphy. It's just a method. So six stratigraphy is not a science. Six stratigraphy is not the uh, concepts or ideas. Six stratigraphy is not for sure a revolution. It's like that thinking. Uh, actually, the the main uh, ideas behind six stratigraphy uh, were developed in the 1800s, right? So what actually six stratigraphy did was to apply some of these old ideas in new data, things that people didn't have in the 1800s, like uh, seismic lines that you could see entire basin fields, uh, well logs, cores, and all, you know, you know the outcrop work that goes with that. So, uh, so actually, that was when you merge some old ideas with uh, new data. This is actually what was the uh, the main contribution of Peter Veil and colleagues where they, they apply that uh, in seismic analogs. So, um, so consider that I'm talking about that. If you think about uh, the uh, six stratigraphy uh, or a stratigraphy, how it evolved through time, and the vertical scale here uh, is, you know, starting the 1700s uh, on top and goes up to, to, to 2000s uh, down. Uh, and I break those uh, stratigraphers here in three different groups, the diastrophists, the neptunism, and the hermeneutic uh, circle. Uh, uh, for those of you that are there, uh, anybody knows what uh, diastrophism is? You remember, you remember the astrophism? Anybody want to jump in on that bomb? <laughs> Yeah, so diastrophism deals, deals with uh, uh, geological catastrophic events. So the explosion of a big volcano or uh, meteorite impact, right? Uh, uh, so the idea is that uh, these major catastrophic events can actually uh, produce surfaces or deposits that you can follow for long distances in the geological record, right? So for instance, the explosion of a big volcano, you can, you can have this ash layer that goes for thousands of kilometers and can be a, a great stratigraphic marker. So if you look at the, down the, the list of, uh, of the several heroes of the diastrophism, uh, Peter Bay is there with, uh, with Bob Mitchell and so on. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, Pete actually was one, one of the last uh, diastrophists, right? So the, uh, so the uh, catastrophic event that uh, Pete was looking for were um, the flooding of, um, you know, bigger parts of a big continent or sea level falls that expose the entire shelf, right? So this is what, uh, what, uh, what are the catastrophic events that uh, Peter Bay was looking for, I mean, what mentioned, and all the colleagues. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, and that actually is a, a first hint about the method. So uh, with that, uh, with the method that they start to develop in the, seven, uh, in the 1970s, uh, and then continue to develop up to the, to the 1980s, uh, with that method, when you apply the method, you can actually identify basically two types of surfaces, uh, unconformities and flooding surfaces. In that case, marine flooding surface. And uh, uh, so uh, the unconformities in six stratigraphy, just to start to throw some names out there, uh, we call them sequence boundaries. And uh, in marine flooding surfaces, we have uh, a few different types and then requires a bit more information to actually break them apart. Uh, but, uh, but we start there. We start uh, defining marine flooding surfaces and unconformities, and that's the method. And this is what, uh, what the six stratigraphy is. Six stratigraphy, as I said, is not the revolution that we are thinking, is not a new science or, or new concepts even. What it is is a method. It's a method to interpret uh, subsurface data uh, to decrease risk for petroleum uh, systems uh, elements, the presence of them. So, so if you apply the method right, you can decrease the risk for reservoir presence, for seal presence, uh, even source rock presence, and all that. Uh, 
so that's who, that's why the six stratigraphy was invented. That was the goal, right? And uh, and uh, I don't know how many of you remember the 70s, <laughs> but in the 70s uh, the there was this seismic revolution, and seismic data to the lines, regional to the lines, they were getting better and better and more wells. And uh, so so we've got uh, the advent of this uh, big seismic lines. Uh, one reaction that the industry had was, oh, that's great. Uh, we are very, uh, now we are going to decrease the risk for reservoir presence, for seal and all that, because we are going to see everything. Well, that was not right. Because uh, you don't see actually uh, these lithologies when you look at the seismic line, what you, what you see is just change the impedance. That could be caused by sands or mud, mud or sand, mud or mud, sand or sand, giving the same seismic response or very similar. So that was the uh, bad news of the 70s. But that, actually, that's what motivated the research uh, to go, OK, if, uh, what else can we do then uh, if uh, in the seismic we don't see lithologies, we see impedance? So what else can we do? to actually go from uh, that those uh, seismic geometries, uh, uh, how can we go from there to say that uh, if there's sand there or not, if there's seal there or not, and so on. So that was the work that was done. That's the reason why six stratigraphy actually was born. Uh, so let me talk about uh, some of these other folks too. Uh, Neptunism, uh, that was uh, the stratigraphy that everybody used uh, in the 1700s. And the idea is that uh, the world had a big ocean in the beginning. And uh, uh, so then the Earth would be dominated by a single uh, depositional environment. And that uh, idea evolved, uh, even uh, the people look at the granites in the different continents and say, how, how can they deposit those big crystals and all that? And then it's all over the world. Uh, so the idea was, you know, you have a big ocean in the beginning, and then that's where those crystals came from. Uh, so the idea, the, the idea evolved of uh, Werner, and Werner actually uh, created the uh, uh, um, universal ocean doctrine, and that was the basis of lit stratigraphy. So basically, the idea was that a single time, uh, uh, and on single geological time the Earth would be dominated by a specific depositional system. So sometimes the Earth would be completely uh, non marine or completely deep water or completely, uh, you know, shallow marine, right? What are the chances? But that was actually uh, the, the, the basis for lead stratigraphy. Lead stratigraphy actually evolved from that. Uh, and actually the, the hero here, if there's a hero or if there's a, a revolution in this story here, uh, I don't know if you see my cursor or not, but uh, it's this guy here, Grizzly, in the early 1800s that come up with the concept of phases. And, uh, uh, and actually, if you want a revolution, that was a revolution because everything actually evolved, uh, culminating in six stratigraphy, is starting with the idea of phases and phases stacking, uh, lateral and vertical uh, stacking of phases. Uh, as, as a, a predictive mechanism uh, to understand distribution of the position environments. And then with that, when I apply that to, uh, to the industry, I know uh, I, I increase my chances of finding sands and muds and uh, maybe even source rocks in the absence of uh, well control. So, so faces and facial stacking was the base of everything. And that was basically developed transgression, regressions, all those things were developed in the 1800s, uh, including the, the, astro, uh, the astrophysical concept that was Chamberlain in the late 1800s uh, that uh, later evolved uh, quite fast in the, in the mid uh, 1900s with uh, Castor, Wheeler and his laws, Wheeler and laws being very important on that. And, uh, and, uh, and actually, his laws are quite important because uh, both Peter Vey and Bob Mitchum did their PhDs under his laws. So, and his laws actually was the first one to use the term sequence in a similar way that we use today. And uh, as, a, as a generically related uh, set of strata that's bounded by unconformities 
And uh, at that time, he was not talking too much about the correlative conformity, although he was actually mapping them. Uh, so, so then, uh, and then Vevan Michin, actually working with them, with uh, with his loss, uh, they actually continue their, their research in in the Exome Production Research Lab, uh, based on what we're doing uh, during their PhDs. So, uh, and the last the column here, the hermeneutic circle, that's kind of an important one that, uh, that is the concept of bias, right? The, the good bias and the bad bias. Bias doesn't mean bad. So, or, or put in another word uh, or in another way, uh, you cannot unlearn what you learn, right? So if you learn, now you cannot forget that anymore. And that's dangerous and that's, that's good and dangerous at the same time, right? So you need to keep learning, so you don't stop there. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and the bias, the bias is affected by several things that are outside science, right? Uh, it's affected by, by uh, society. For instance, uh, the first folks that start to talk about uh, evolution and the final succession by evolution, uh, and that was in the 1800s and, and actually late 1700s, well, a religion was quite important back then, and uh, and uh, and this thing about evolution didn't go too well. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that uh, hold science for a while, and some of those folks actually end up having you know really serious problems because of their ideas that was so against the uh, religious beliefs of the time. So that's part of what the hermeneutic circle means, is that uh, there's good bias, there are bad bias, and you cannot forget uh, that you're being influenced by what's around you, right? So um, let's keep going on that. If you have any questions, uh, you can stop me at uh, any time. So uh, so just, uh, just I don't know if you ever notice, but uh, the original terms, right, for system tracks and six stratigraphy, high stand, transgress, and low stand. Have you ever noticed that these names don't go together? So you have a high stand, a low stand that uh, imply sea level changes, and a transgress in the middle, right? And uh, and remember, transgression was something that people were talking about in the 1800s, and uh, transgression was actually defined as the lateral movement of the shoreline towards the continent. So in, in, the, in the definition of transgression, there's no sea level rise. Interesting, right? So transgression means lateral movement of the shoreline towards the continent. Regression means lateral movement of the shoreline towards the basin. OK, so but of course, it's easy to think that um, you can, uh, you know, nothing better than a sea level rise to cause a transgression. But we all know that's not only sea level changes that matter, right? You need to play with all the variables. And sedimentation rates is also important. So you can have a time that sea level is rising with the same rate. If you increase sedimentation rate, you can cause regression. If you decrease sedimentation rate, you can cause transgression with the same rate of rising sea level, right? So transgressive, regressive are not sea level terms. They are lateral movement shoreline terms. So they don't go together. Then that term that don't go together, high stand and low stand. So, so that's for me is the beginning of the problem in six stratigraphy. That we, hey, you know, yes? Albert uh, has asked a question. Mm -hmm. Is he's curious where uniformitism of Hutton falls in these developments? Uh, but that's a that's a tricky one. <laughs> Probably why he asked it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it, it falls pretty well actually, right? I don't. Uh, it, it does. It does fall well uh, in, in a sense of uh, of. Uh, these environments tend to repeat through time, right? So, so in that sense, it it doesn't hurt. But I'm not sure if I'm, I'm hitting your point, or if, or if you have, uh, or if you want to uh, 
uh, extend your comment. But uh, while, while he chew on that, uh, we continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, but then, but then you going back to the terminology. Why they didn't come with a high stand, mid stand, low stand, or lower regressive, transgressive, and upper regressive? Why this mixed terminology, right? Why they did that? Well, there's there's a, there's a reason, and uh, and that actually uh, started for two good of two good old friends, uh, Pete and Bob. As I said, they were uh, classmates. They did their PhD together. They actually were renting an apartment. They were living together doing the, their PhDs. They're good friends until today. And uh, working with uh, Zloss in their PhDs. And then they graduated. They went to work in two different companies. Axel went there, bought the two companies. And they were working back together again in the Axon Production Research Lab and continued after research they started with Zloss. So uh, they developed the method. They basically applied the method that they learned from SLOS and that was developed with SLOS uh, uh, now to seismic that uh, SLOS didn't have much access to and, uh, but uh, easy to get in action. So they applied that to seismic. That's the reason why in the beginning, the name was seismic stratigraphy. Uh, and, uh, and they working close together with several other colleagues from, from Axon at the time. Uh, but uh, despite the fact that uh, Pete and Bob they developed the method together, uh, the science that Peter Bay was after was used to see. He was very curious about it because uh, he started to build, uh, you know, to really detail interpretation sites and lines, and, uh, and then he started to build those coastal overlaps, uh, basically encroachment of sediment over the continent through time and falling that through time with the best age control they could get. That was not that great at the time. But uh, despite of all the limitations, he started to see trends that would repeat on a scale. Like on average, you know, the mid Cretaceous, the act, the ACT, right, is a higher sea level uh, than what happens in the end of the restriction. Uh, you have sea level rises in the Prisian or in the uh, uh, yeah in the Prisian, and then you have a sea level fall in the middle Ligocene. You can have a sea level rise in the Langian in the middle Miocene. So so you have trends that seems to repeat not everywhere, but uh, was more than coincidental. So Peter was then doing applying the method, working very hard seismic data, but uh, he was after used to see. So Bob Mitchin, uh, during those times, during the 70s, there was a lot of names that have been created, and like the lowest end and the highest end. In the 70s, there was no transgression. Uh, and that's uh, and for those of you that, uh, that uh, work in seismic, you know that transgression often is very hard to see in seismic. It's too thin. Uh, so then was, was uh, misrepresented in the beginning of the 70s. So, so then what Pete, Pete would see is was one sequence that would be in the middle of a basin uh, where you see continental strata overlapping against marine strata. That's the downward shifting coastal overlap of Peter Vale. When you have this continental strata overlapping marine strata in the middle of the basin, and then people, and then Pete thought, well, maybe that should be a major level fall. So below stand. And then was followed by another sequence that would be covering the entire basin, and then say, well, that must be high level. So he called high stand. So it was actually when other players are starting the game, like in the, uh, from the 70s to the 80s with uh, Henry Posamentia and von Wagner. Uh, Pete was uh, helping mentoring uh, Posamentia, Bob Mitchin and some others were, uh, were mentoring von Wagner. And, uh, uh, and actually uh, the, at that point, uh, they realized that uh, the downlap surface that in the 70s was being used as an evidence for an unconformity, uh, thanks to the bistratigraphers, they figured out that, uh, that the downlap surface was actually a condensed section. All, all biosomes were there, they were just very thin, very small, very condensed. Uh, so a new surface was born that was called maximum flooding surface. And uh, who actually did the research on that was Bob Mitchell and von Wagner. And, uh, and working uh, cores and logs and, uh, and outcrops, they realized that below that surface, 
the uh, shoreline was moving towards the continent. So the new systems track that was born at that time, that at that point was Bob and, and John that put the name, was called transgressive because Bob Meachin is very observational based. And then, so he observed that the shoreline was moving towards the continent and then rather than call it neat stand, they call it transgressive. So that was that story. And then uh, in the eighties also the cat was out of the bag and, uh, and, uh, and the researchers uh, start to work more and more and more uh, on sex stratigraphy. And, and, then, uh, uh, and then there was folks that were really focused on the sea level curves, on the Eustace and where the, where the uh, surfaces should fall in a, in a static cycle or in a, or in a, uh, in a curve or curve showing relative changes in sea level. And, uh, and then you have other group of folks that actually focus more on the basic observations of uh, facies, uh, facies stacking, lateral and vertical variation of facies, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and then with that, there was this explosion of terms, right? So uh, our approach now, uh, what we suggest is uh, back to basics. Uh, so uh, try to use terminology that is observational based like transgression, regression, progradation, retrogradation, things that can actually be served directly from the data, and then use facies, facial associations, vertical stacking, stricto geometries, and stricto terminations, because this is what you see in nature. So if you have seismic, you see more of the stricto geometries and stricto terminations. If you have an outcrop, you can see all of that. Uh, if you mix your seismic of well log scores, and then you can also see all of that. Well, a key, a key point here is that all these terms, transgression, regression, progradation, retrogradation, those are shoreline position or shoreline trajectory terms. They are not sea level terms. So I already discussed about transgression and regressions. So uh, progradation is where the uh, shoreline is moving towards the basin through time. Retrogradation is when the uh, shoreline is moving towards the continent through time. So progradation and retrogradation are vertical stacking, right, terms. Uh, so, uh, so then uh, you can have uh, terms like, uh, like uh, this one degradation is the term that the Wheeler used in the 40s that uh, after that people, were, it's the same as falling stage or force regression. Uh, so Wheeler uh, call it degradation. Uh, so, but we see a stacking that seems to repeat that goes from the uh, progradation to aggradation, um, retrogradation, aggradation, progradation, and degradation. And that's the, uh, what you see in one, in, in one succession. And you can see that in this, uh, in this line. Where you, where you have the in yellow in this drawing, uh, the shoreline position that uh, in the low stand, uh, and uh, let me know if you see my cursor or not. So prograde is an aggrade. So it's a progradational package that I'm adding accommodation to time. So means sea level is rising. So sea level rises for most of the low stand. What, uh, you know, it's kind of, kind of disappointing, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but this is what uh, the, the, the system track is. Uh, and then, but uh, sea level rises up to a point where the rate of accommodation creation overwhelms sedimentation rate. So it creates too much accommodation and then you cause the backstepping, you cause the shoreline migrate towards the continent. So that's the retrogradation stack uh, that's occurring during overall transgression. Uh, if you want to understand in a simple way what a sequence is, uh, is actually a package or a stack of, uh, of strata that start with uh, negative accommodation the shelf, go to maximum accommodation, and then negative accommodation the shelf again, meaning unconformity on the shelf, maximum accommodation that actually is the first part of sequence of the high stand, to negative accommodation again, shelf exposure. So shelf exposure to shelf exposure with a maximum accommodation in the middle. Uh, so when you when when that happened, this shoreline trajectory here will occur. And this is a, a great work that was done uh, by Wolfgang Schlager. He published in Geology in 2004, 
that he called the uh, fractal nature of uh, sequences and systems tracks in quotes, uh, where he said that uh, this trend uh, always repeat as long as you start from negative accommodation to maximum accommodation to negative again, you're going to have the shoreline trajectory that uh, will have this shape of this S and uh, the letter, right? So you prograde a grade, you retrograde, you are grade in the beginning of the high stand, prograde really fast, and degrade at the end of the high stand. That's the force regression, that's the falling stage. Uh, we use the term from Wheeler because uh, he was the first one to name it. Uh, so, and it's also a stack, so it's the degradation stack. But uh, that point is when the product sequences are down stepping into the basin as the sea level is falling. So, well, what the name of the system track is high stand. I said, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the name is not that great because if you think about uh, during this whole time and you see this continue on lap here during the sequence, meaning sea level is rising since the lowest stand, rises throughout the transgressive and rises in the beginning of the high stand, right? That's the reason why you have a sedimentary record, right? Because you're creating accommodation at the time. So that's the reason why the sediments are preserved. The, the uh, sea level fall start occurring in the late stages of the high stand. The sequence boundary actually goes on top of the uh, force regression, on top of the falling stage, depending on what nomenclature you prefer. Uh, and then the next uh, big uh, low stands uh, will happen on top of that. Vitor, in those yes. rises, um, you're referring to them as sea level rises, but some of them your thoughts on you know, the term relative sea level rise that comes out there when you have areas where yeah. uh, tectonics are impactful. Good, good, good. So when I say sea level rise, what I mean is, is uh, uh, or sea level changes, I mean relative changes in sea level. So I'm already combining in my head all of them. Because we, we, it, often we don't know. Often we don't know if it's glacial static, if, if it's tectonic, uh, is uh, a combination more often than not. And uh, so, so when, you, when you hear me say sea level changes, what I mean is relative change in sea level, right? So, uh, uh, so if I say sea level rise, I'm saying is a relative rise in sea level. So I say a sea level fall, I say is a, a relative fall in sea level. That's okay? Sounds good? Yes, thank you. Yeah, because, because at the end of the day, when you play with uh, with uh, with uh, the variables, right? So the controls on a sequence. So we have uh, uh, sediment supply, uh, eustacy, tectonics, uh, climate, and uh, uh, basin geometry or initial depositional profile, right? So so when you think about those, actually what you can put your hands on is what we call accommodation. And accommodation is already uh, integrating uh, relative changes in sea level with sediment supply, for instance. And when I look at this para sequencing here, I have a lot of accommodation on the shelf, right? I'm always creating accommodation and I have sediments enough to fill. It's different from that para sequence there that I have no accommodation on the shelf. The only accommodation that I have is in front of the previous client form. So accommodation is very useful because I can see it and I can measure it and I can follow the trends through time. Other thing you can measure is sediment supply and the sediment supply then will be also a consequence of tectonics and climate, uh, even used to see, right? Dependent for, for local changes in, in, in sedimentation rate. And uh, uh, so, so despite of the fact that you have those five variables that are so important, two of them, summarize all those five and you can actually measure in the geological record uh, so they're quite useful uh, and uh, and actually this balance of uh, changes in accommodation creation and destruction through time and sedimentation rate uh, during a time where you start with negative accommodation or shelf exposure to maximum accommodation until culminate with the next negative accommodation again, the next sequence boundary, that's where this uh, accommodation succession, if you will, of uh, progradation, aggradation, retrogradation, aggradation, progradation, degradation of course. So, uh, so the stacking of a low stand is of a PA, progrades and aggrades. 
The stacking of a retrogradation is the R or the transgressive system track. So the stacking is R retrogradation. And for the high stand, start very gradational when you have a balance again between the rate of accommodation creation and limitation rate. But the end of the story uh, will be shelf uh, exposure here. So I need to be killing accommodation through time. In killing accommodation through time, sea levels start falling. Uh, so in the last stages of the high stand, you have a slow fall uh, or a slow relative fall of sea level that, uh, that uh, will change to a fast fall and the, uh, and the formation of the sequence boundary. So far, so good. We are. We, are we still friends? Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm. <laughs> I learned from you, so you know, so, I don't know what the rest of the people think. Yeah. So, how, how many of them did I lost? <laughs> <laughs> so, one thing that's important uh, about the terminology. Terminology is there to to communicate. That to help communications. Let's start that. So my, my uh, advice when, uh, when I'm consulting in projects or teaching classes is that uh, use terminology that people understand. So if, you, if, you, if you're using terminology that nobody understand, then don't use it, right? You're not helping communication. Uh, one, one important thing about terminology, about term, is recognition criteria. Right, and sometimes, and there are papers out there suggesting new surfaces or new system tracks, and they don't give any recognition criteria. So, if I don't know how to recognize in, in seismic wells, core outcrops, so those are the letters here. Uh, in so, and then it's not useful. That doesn't work for me. So, if uh, for instance. I use the uh, the original terms of six stratigraphy, the first one proposed, because that that's the scientific method. The first one that proposed wins, but I like other terms. I like other terms that I call them translation terms. For instance, if you think about transgression, uh, and I told you guys that, okay, you have an unconformity uh, that we call in six stratigraphy a sequence boundary, but then with the method, I can also identify a marine flooding surface. Okay. So the marine flooding surface, the marine flooding surface that's the base, is the beginning of a major transgression, that one uh, is the uh, transgressive surface uh, that's also known as the point of a maximum regression by a simple fact. So I prograde and I grade up the point of a maximum regression. So that's the maximum regressive surface. It's awesome name. The name of the surface is basically the definition of the surfaces. It's fantastic. So, uh, so I like that. But that uh, is the same as transgressive surface. So they are synonymous. And that marks the beginning of the, tran of the transgression. The end of the transgression is marked by the landermost position of the shoreline or the point of maximum transgression. That's equivalent to the maximum flooding surface. So in that S, of the shoreline trajectory, you have uh, the landwardmost position of the shoreline, that's transgressive surface of the maximum regressive surface, and the uh, landwardmost position of the shoreline, that's the maximum transgressive surface or maximum flooding, sur uh, maximum flooding surface. So that's the beginning of the transgression, that's the end of the transgression, right? So if you see a retrogradation stack in a, in a well log, that's great, because you already kill one system track, transgress system track, and two surfaces, a transgress surface at the base and a maximum flooding at the, at the top. So in this, what, uh, uh, for each one of those uh, uh, surfaces, uh, we, we, we point out the main recognition criteria and secondary criteria based on wells, cores, and outcrop, based on other methods, right? And, uh, and, uh, and you're going to have access to that, so you can read at your leisure. Uh, so, and for the system tracks and, uh, and that annoying fact that uh, sea level rises during most of the low stand and sea level falls at the end of the high stand, that drive people's nuts. Uh, the, the definition of the system tracks, despite the fact that the names are not that great, 
the definitions were really good. So, uh, so bounding surfaces and internal stacking is part of the definition of assistance track. So a low assistance track is bounded at the base by a sequence boundary at the top by a transgressive surface and it has a progradation to gradation stack. Uh, a high stand has a maximum flooding at the base, a sequence boundary at the top, and a grades and progrades, sometimes degrades. Uh, the force regression and the uh, and, uh, or a falling stage, uh, Peter Veil would call late high stand. Uh, that is, uh, we don't see too often in seismic. It's hard to see. I will show examples. But uh, when you see it, you have to treasure it because it's very important for you as an explorationist. And, uh, and we're going to explore that. Uh, so then we start uh, from, so the method then, we start from the basic observations, like I said, facies, facial associations, vertical stacking of facies, uh, straight to geometries, straight to terminations. With that, you define your surfaces. So the method is designed to look for a surface. So we go after a, first, a surface first. And then uh, could be a maximum flooding surface because it's a big marine flooding surface that in all logs often, not always, but often can look uh, as, a, as a really hot gamma. So it's easy to identify. Uh, sequence boundaries, uh, if I have seismic, I can see more evidence for uh, uh, an unconformity with truncations and all apps. So, so it can be the uh, easier to identify. So depending on the data set you have, uh, some of the surfaces will be uh, easier or better to be recognized than others. So you start with, uh, you know, what I like to say, you know, do the easy first. And because uh, when you do the easy part first, you know, what's a little bit more complicated or harder in your data becomes a bit easier. So, and then as you define your surfaces and then now in stacking, and then you can identify your system track. And then you do what's important that you, you go there, make your maps and, uh, and look for the opportunities, right? So, so we're going to discuss about that. So I will not uh, uh, dwell much more on this, but uh, the lowest stand is the PA, the progradation, degradation, transgressive is the R, retrogradation, and the green or the high stand is the APD or aggradation, progradation. Sometimes with degradation stacking at the end, like in here, the down stepping of, of part sequences. The, uh, so this is nothing new. This is actually, uh, this actually is based on work done by Jervy that was uh, published in, in 1988 in the SAPM 42 publication. And, uh, and he was the one that defined those trends. We're just, uh, we're just you know, bringing this back uh, so we can take uh, good use of that. Right. So this is nothing, that not, there's nothing new here. Uh, so that's another important paper. And that's one, uh, one was from Michin and Wagner in 91, where they define sequence, sequence sets and composite sequences. What that means that I can have a PA in here, a prograding to a grading wedge uh, that stacks like a, a low stand, but that uh, at now this uh, dark lines in here, the black lines, they are sequence boundaries. So now I have sequences stacking like a low stand, and then you call them low stand sequence set. So in the past, people use orders to break those things apart and call this would be third order, maybe that's a second order. Uh, so I, I prefer this approach from, uh, from a mission of von Wagner because this is just uh, doing stratigraphy based on the physical relationship of strata, nothing else. So then you pay attention to the shoreline position, shoreline trajectory, the changes in accommodation to time. Like uh, when I go to the high stand, I start very gradational, and then I go uh, progradational to degradational, and that will be the force regression of the following stage. Okay, now real data. So uh, that's the drawing from uh, Bob and John, and that's the seismic. And actually they did this drawing here. They never saw this line before. That's for me the most impressive part. So transgression, if you look at the transgression, is the blue here, uh, goes to nothing uh, at close to the previous shell break. Transgression means basin starvation. So if I'm pushing the sediments to go uh, uh, towards the continent, uh, the consequence of that is that uh, it will be a sharp decrease in sedimentation rate uh, in the basin, right? 
So, uh, so in the drawing here, they represent as this as this wedge that's thickening oops, towards uh, the land, right? Getting thicker and thicker and thicker towards the land. So that's easy. So when I look at the seismic, and I see this patching here that getting thicker and thicker and thicker towards the land, right? So that seems to be that. So that's awesome because because of this easy uh, geometry, uh, because it's the only one that's thickening in the wrong direction, right? Everything else is thickening towards the basin. These guys, these guys are thickening towards the land. Uh, so with that, I, I can recognize the transgressive or the transgression, and that sits like a hat on top of a low stand that is progradational but always adding accommodation through time, just like the drawing uh, from Bob and John, right? So this is what they meant by that uh, progradation, progradation up to the point of maximum regression. So that would be the composite trans uh, transgressive surface. That would be a composite maximum flooding surface, a low stand sequence set, transgressive sequence set, and a high stand sequence set. So that would be more or less the idea. And, uh, and for those of you that like the, uh, so that would be how you break it in this three sequence sets. But for those of you that like uh, forced regression, let's take a look at one and it's right there. So I have a top lap more or less in here and a top lap there, other top laps. Uh, up to here, and then now I have my own lap and all the top laps there. So sea level is falling from here to here and down to there. And actually, in, the, in, the, in this forced regression or falling stage, that actually I have own laps against it. So that's the final gasp of the high stand in this case. So as I said, it's subtle. It doesn't jump at you, but it's very important. And the reason why it's so important is because you can actually make money with that. So in this case in here, that's the same line showing the composite sequence boundary, the, uh, the lowest stand prograding and grading up to the point of maximum regression, the transgressive surface, and then the uh, maximum flooding there and the high stand. So I have a falling stage or forced regression here and here. So in the two high stand sequence sets towards the end, but uh, when I map the unconformity from the basin, from the shelf to the basin, here we go. Now I have my fan on lapping against the sequence boundary. And actually the whole stand actually laps against the, uh, the falling stage or the first regression, right? So that this big fan here post date uh, that, uh, that uh, 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 first regression there. But uh, this, uh, that's the reason why, uh, despite of the fact that the observation is subtle, it doesn't jump at you, like, uh, like I said before. So that's the, that's the observations, this downstepping. In this case, those are high frequency sequences. Uh, and the importance of that is that uh, uh, this indicates a big unconformity. Uh, the shelf at that point is completely exposed when the, when the shoreline re reaches its position. So with that, you can have more favorable conditions of a more uh, uh, clean bypass of sediments from the continent going through the shelf and being directly deposited in the basin. So that's the classic veil type of uh, basin for fan. Right? Can I ask a methodology yes. question real quick? Mm -hmm. So when you're coming into these lines and, and doing your putting your framework together, you yes. start big and fill in? Do you try to just mark all your surfaces and go for a lot of detail first? What would be your methodology of how to actually go in and because you're you know you're showing examples where you're going down to a fairly high level of, of detail in a in a more subset of it. How how do you work through that? Is it big to small, small to big? Uh well depends, right? Depends on my data set. Uh, so in seismic, I start uh, big, right? I, st uh, it, uh, I, I, I try to look at uh, the big geometries. So that's the reason why uh, when I see a prograding wedge or a progradation package, because you can look at the site and say, oh, this whole thing here is progradation, right? 
you know, say from down through here to there, everything is progradational. When I see something like that, what I look for is actually the transgression. I look for the transgression because it's the only package in the entire part of this prograding wedge that is taking in the wrong direction, right? It's easy to recognize. So you, you do what is easy first, right? So when you do what is easy first, what's more difficult becomes a bit easier, right? Uh, so, so in your well logs, like, uh, you know, the folks, uh, you know, the folks that are really work hard well logs in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, they, 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 they would get to their well log cross section, put away from them in a, in a wall, and at first they would go for the hot gammas, right? And they would get their green pencil and mark all the hot gammas that they could see, and uh, so with that, uh, they have a, a easy surface already. They have candidates for maximum flooding surface uh, because maximum flooding surface mean land or most position shoreline. So mean basing starvation. So I could have a relative enrichment of uh, organic matter in that spot because I have uh, not much of a clay and silt to dilute my organic matter. That's 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 the reasoning. Right. Thank you. So then I'm also going to make you aware of the time. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, a, sorry. Yeah, people will be willing to, to stay a little past uh, the time we talked about because this is fascinating. OK, keep going. <laughs> so uh, so uh, in the end, I, I, I look for the day. I look at the data and see what's easy. Right. And I'll do that first. Uh, and in this case, this line is, is, is a beautiful line. Right. So the the stacking of uh, these different progradational packages, you see that those are, are different, right? I, I add accommodation through time in this progradational package. In this one, I'm keen accommodation through time. Or well, like in this one, I'm also keen accommodation. And because I want to show you what he's doing. Come here, fast, fast. He's going to be, he's taking a <laughs> seismic line and he's explaining how to interpret it. 30 years uh, Somebody now, Somebody has the, uh, the sound on. Time. He's one of the Godoylo. <laughs> He's Italian. He went over a whole thing of his how to uh, uh, it's, it's better to uh, somebody that has the the uh, microphone on. So, uh, but I appreciate the enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's that's uh, but that's the application of the method in a nutshell, uh, and. Uh, and uh, with the idea of going back to basics. So uh, I'm not uh, here uh, uh, selling uh, terminology. Uh, if you have uh, other terminology that pre you prefer to use, go ahead. Just make sure that you read definition, right? And, uh, and know exactly what that term means. Um, so in my case, I use the old names, uh, but, uh, but I like some of the new ones and, uh, and I use as translation terms. Uh, and sometimes it's better just to describe what you're seeing, right? Uh, for instance, you can go and say, well, it's interesting because I'm in a basinal setting here. I have a high amplitude continuous overlapping the slope, downlapping the basin, mounted reflections that are also high frequency. So I have more reflections here for the same thickness as, as there, almost five times more. So this is a five times higher frequency than here. Right. So this is a very good start of a conversation. Right. So if we, if in the end this maps like a fan, that's great. Now you have uh, you are along the pathway of this of decreasing uh, uh, sand presence risk. Right. So for let's jump to well logs now. And as I said, I mean that you use the gamma. Gamma is also known as a little log. Uh, and, and here is my horizontal scale from 60 to 150. Uh, so the high numbers are to the right. So this is what we call the hot events. And then you start to mark the hot gammas. 
So if you have a hot gamma and then you look below and you see evidence for a, a retrogradation stack, meaning my depositional systems are getting more and more distal, and then on top of it, I see evidence for progradation stack, meaning my depositional systems are getting more and more proximal. Now you decrease a lot the uncertainty here that this uh, that that could not be a maximum flooding surface. Probably it is a good candidate for a maximum flooding surface. And now that you define retrogradation stack, you have two surfaces. You have maximum flooding at the end of the transgression, and you have the transgressed surface at the beginning of the transgression, right? So how you can make money with that? So now I have, uh, now we are in Venezuela, uh, and you have in the uh, Lake Maracaibo Basin, uh, two formations, two Miocene formations, the Ecotia, that are the sands, and the La Rosa, that are the muds on top of that and you produce from the Contia sands. Uh, the issue was that they are trying to inject in this good sense in here to produce on top of the structure and nothing was happening. Of course, you put a fault here, right? That I thought everybody would do. Uh, well, maybe it's not that. So first thing, uh, that's actually a, a real story because Peter Veil uh, worked that project. And, uh, and then the first thing he did was to map flooding surfaces. He put several flooding surfaces there uh, this is the Eocene nonconformity. Below is Eocene. On top is Miocene. The entire Legocene is missing. And he start to, to map those, uh, uh, those uh, flooding surfaces from well to well, one by one, following the same recognition criteria. So those are flooding surfaces that's on top of uh, a costing up. Uh, there are two uh, bumps, two bumps on, you know, above and below, and always following the same criteria until you get to a point that as you follow uh, your markers, you realize that uh, that's the chronostatigraphic interpretation uh, that you can mark a low stand, a transgressive, and a high stand. And actually, the sands you're producing from, those are transgressive sands. The ones that you're trying to inject are actually low stand sands. They're even uh, not even, uh, they are younger and disconnected from those sands. So that picture here, that's the little study graph picture that uh, if I were drawing here, would go with something like that, right? So that was the original uh, interpretation that was basically, uh, that's a little study graph interpretation, is not a, a chron study graph one. Sounds good? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we're close to the end now. So off-log break is very important. And, uh, and then people say, well, well that's, that's uh, some people call shoreline uh, trajectory using actually what is an off-log break. So what you do is an off-log break trajectory that, uh, that uh, it can be uh, close to a shelf break. It could have, at that time of the, uh, at that time of the position, the last position of the shoreline there. But it's for sure a flood break, maybe a shelf break, maybe, maybe at the, <laughs> the last position of the shoreline. Uh, but you use that because it's a fixed point in, in time and space that you can co compare to the other ones and see if you are adding accommodation through time or decreasing accommodation through time. So the system tracks are bounded by surfaces and have a specific stack inside. And I already talked about the surfaces. So, but uh, where are these, where's this level then in all this? Well, in the minds of men and women. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm very well known by my bad jokes. Uh, or better, <laughs> be a little bit more polite. C level changes cannot be directly observed from geological record. Shoreline trajectory can. So let's use what, what you can put your hands on and, uh, and then after that, after I have the interpretation done, and then I can think about this level. I cannot do it beforehand, right? So for instance, this is the uh, amazing work from uh, Bhattacharya and, and, uh, and students, and that's from Wen Li. Uh, they mapped the heck out of the Ferron. Uh, so these are actually, uh, you have several measure sections here. There's a nice uh, outcrop uh, succession. Uh, and where they map parasequences and uh, sequence boundaries in red. 
uh, and you have a sequence boundaries on lap against sequence boundary in here, like this one. And uh, and this face in here, this like green one, this is continental strata. So I have continental strata lapping against marine strata. Uh, and that's the uh, what the so-called basin or shift in coastal lap when you have continental strata lapping against marine strata. So that's per definition is the position of the sequence boundary. Uh, that's the primary recognition criteria of the sequence boundaries, the downward shift of the coastal lap, meaning coastal sediments lapping against more distal sediments. But you see in the outcrop aggradation, progradation, degradation, that's the force regression for the stage. Uh, and you can actually walk there and, 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 and see for yourself. Uh, so so this, uh, uh, this is an application in the outcrop, but it's easily can be then seismic. Uh, well logs, you have to work a little bit harder, but uh, if you use the, the method in a, in, a, in a consistent way, uh, uh, you, uh, you know, uncertainty is part of our lives. Uh, you, you, the best you can do is to decrease that uncertainty. And for sure, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good way to do that. If your job, uh, if you are in the petroleum industry, right? If you are in the petroleum industry, what I told you in the stock is more than enough uh, to, to decrease uh, reservoir presence risk, decrease uh, seal presence risk, even to uh, uh, better evaluate presence and quality of source rock, and then migration pathways and so forth, so on and so forth. So what we propose then is just one method that's a succession of accommodation change and sediment fill observed from stratal patterns and facial stacking relative to key bounding surfaces, not defined by time duration nor relative changes in sea level, uh, placed into a hierarchical framework and calibrated with age control. So one thing at a time. All right, well, thanks so much. And sorry if I, I run a, a little bit out of time. No, 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 that, that's all right. I'm, if people want to hang for a few more minutes. I'm sure Vitor would be willing to answer whatever questions folks may have. So far, I've been the one asking all the questions. So, but we are happy to take questions from anyone um, that would like to ask one. Uh, feel free. You all have control of both your camera and also of your microphone. Um, if you would like to ask a question of, of Vitor about his presentation. OK. Linda T. Linda, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I'm seeing here some questions uh, asking for references. Uh, do they have access to my email? Uh, yes, they will. That will be at the yeah. HBS website, the same place where you registered. Um, yeah. Or if not, we can definitely provide it via HGS. I think your email was on there. Yeah, so send me, send me uh, for those of you that uh, want to uh, uh, the papers that I cited in stock and a few other ones, uh, just send me a note and I can, I can direct you to uh, a Dropbox folder with uh, several useful stuff. Oh, thank you, Amanda. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Uh, my name is Juan Pablo Ramos. I am from the University of Houston. So thank you, Vitor, for for the nice talk. I have just one question. So based mm -hmm. on the things that you mentioned, the, the key observations here are the shoreline position and the shoreline trajectory. But I'm yes. just wondering, how do we work? What is like the methodology when we don't have a shoreline? I, I'm thinking about, for Excellent. example, the, Excellent the, question. Yeah, like, for example, the Cooper Basin in Australia, where we just have an intercatronic basin with continental environments. So I'm just wondering mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, and then you go a step before that. The step before that is to changes in accommodation and sedimentation rate through time. For instance, if I have uh, just uh, continental strata, uh, as I increase accommodation in continental strata, for instance, I have a river, right? If, uh, if I increase uh, local, local accommodation, for instance, with a fault, I'll create a lake, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I have a lake, and then I can use all those things because now I have uh, 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 a lake shoreline, right? That uh, that now I have a little ocean that I can play with. 
And, uh, uh, and, then, and then the methodology, the way that we're going to apply the method is the same, uh, the resulting geometries will be different. For instance, if I go from, uh, from a river and create a lake, uh, uh, and then I have a, a dry lake, right? Now I have a, 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 a dry climate and I, I dry my lake and I try to fill my lake with water again. If, I, if I'm filling my lake with water, I'm filling that lake with sediments as well, right? That's the key difference. In the marine realm, the accommodation is there is the ocean. I just add dirt, I'm adding a little bit of water, but that doesn't matter because, hey, you have the ocean there. In a lake, no. In a lake, the sediment go with the water, the water goes sediment. So the accommodation and sediment comes together. So, so then uh, after a, a main uh, dry lake, so I'm starting now my low stand. What happened is that uh, uh, the transgression in a lake can be really thick because as I increase my, my, as I keep putting water inside my lake, my, my lake margin goes away from lake center transgression. So transgressive, the low stands can be thick. The transgression can be really thick in a lake. And that's different than marine strata. That's uh, rarely you see uh, very thick transgression. They do occur, of course, but not as often as in lakes. So if I'm uh, if I'm in deep water that I don't see a shoreline either, and then you play with uh, the uh, uh, radical changes in, in sedimentation rate. For instance, if uh, if uh, in 3,000 meters of water depth and uh, 300 kilometers away from the uh, from the a shelf and sea level falls on the shelf some 100 meters nothing happened to me right i'm 3000 meters of water i'm 300 kilometers away from the shelf sea level can fall 100 meters there nothing happened like in that moment right so what will happen is that after a while some i, I have just clay being deposited there and some dead bugs and then after that, maybe some silts, fine silts will arrive. And then maybe thicker, still thicker lamina of fine silts and more and more silts and, and, and fine to course. Uh, maybe a first sand will arrive until you have a bad day and a major conglomerate to pass through or a major debris flow, right? So what I'm describing is that uh, the sequence boundary in that uh, in that deep water setting could be mud against uh, against mud and you are going to see that to change uh when you went through a sequence boundary because you go from clay and abandonment uh, shales with very low sediment supply or sedimentation rate to silts that would represent almost an order of magnitude increase in sedimentation rate so that's that's how you play the game right okay thank you I think uh, Binga actually is on the line. Um, he had a question as well. Binga, do you want to ask your question? Or do you want Vitor to just look at it and answer? Yes, I mean, I, 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 thanks, thanks. Um, uh, let me go ahead and just ask the question. Oh, thanks again, Victor. Uh, good to hear your voice and see that your gray is uh, beginning to increase. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, my question is, you know, uh, I, I mean, for us here in the Niger Delta, like you know, uh, quite a lot of tectonic activities create many of these accommodation or, you know, mm -hmm. space that is just way outside. So I'm just uh, wondering, in the new researches that are coming up, I'm always looking forward to new diagrams that begins to show a little bit more thoughts, kind of like to more, more like what we see around here more often. So mm -hmm. I'm just trying to see if, if in these clarifications, uh, yes. So we integrate more of, of the technology movement. That sometimes you see the local basis, like in yeah. Nigeria. Yeah. yeah. Now, no question, no question, uh, Benga. It's uh, it's uh, you have a very good point, and that's the conundrum of uh, every professor, right? To be able to demonstrate a point, you need the very clear data, right, to make the point. But, uh, but then people say, yeah, but in this data I can see it, in my data I can't, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, all right, but at least I need to sh start showing you <laughs> in, in a good data. So uh, my answer for, for, for folks, you know, in this type of questions that, hey, let's see if it, what if everything's faulted and, and folded? 
Well, it's harder, but you have to do it anyway. <laughs> so it's just more work, <laughs> but it's doable. It's a good question. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And we've, we've all worked those heavily faulted fields with uh, complicated uh, channels going across them, um, which can be challenging, especially oh, and then, yeah. geologic models and, and uh, do fluid flow. Yeah. Yeah, that's where the real action is. And, uh, and uh, at Rice, you know, some of the students say, oh, but that's too hard. And then, uh, and then my answer is, well, the fact that it's hard doesn't mean that you don't have to do it. You have to do it anyway. Exactly. <laughs> hard. Usually hard, hard is where the money is, right? Because yeah, exactly. That's exactly. the fast pay. That's the unswept zones. Um, Claire yeah. Staley had made a comment in here about, thank you so much. Using sequence stratigraphy for environmental remediation is an application method that's gaining acceptance. This was a timely review. Um, so are, are you getting interest detour in, in doing training for environmental remediation using sequence stratigraphic concepts? Uh, no, actually, uh, I, I was never approached to, to help on that. But uh, of course it is, uh, you know, it's, you, you know, it's uh, uh, the method that can be applied for us, uh, you know, in several different, for several different uh, type of, uh, work right uh, from uh, from uh, uh, sedimentary copper to water reservoirs to mm -hmm. carbon sequestration so uh, so you apply the same you know approach right yep so sage has her hand up that would and would like to ask a question Sage, yeah, go yeah. Away. hello hello yeah. Um, my Hi. name is Sage. I'm currently at West Virginia University, and I'm doing my PhD, and I'm researching some transgressive and regressive sequences in my field area. And my uh -huh. question to you is, what about glaciers? Um, I'm running into a lot of problems with glaciers kind of messing up signals. So yeah. what's your advice for those big old ice guys? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, where are your glaciers? I'm I'm currently working in like Devonian stuff, um, the Cleveland Ooh. Shale in Ohio, the right. like Appalachian right. Basin. So <laughs> we're having a lot of that stuff. Okay, and uh, and do you have uh, evidence for uh, sea ice, like uh, drop stones and things like that? Yes, we are seeing mm -hmm. a lot of diamictites. We're seeing yeah. a lot yeah. of um, uh, mm -hmm. drop stones. We're seeing random conglomerate lenses it's just yeah. we're seeing a lot of glaciers and we're trying to make sense yeah. of, of okay. the anoxic conditions for the cleveland shale all right so the the application of the method is still the same right uh you still follow the basic observations facials facial stacking straight alternations uh, straight geometries uh and uh, and we in vertical stacking right so I vertical stack on fish. So the, the the approach is to the same. In your case, the resulting geometries would be way different. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, but you know uh, the because now you're dealing with uh, when when you when you when you start dealing with the CIs, and then you can have the uh, uh, you know the uh, the the this the shelf being invaded by ice you have a lot of weight there uh this will be eventually will be we melted and then we're going to have a local rebound uh and then uh enhancement of uh, that uh unconformity what's better what could be a, a, a more subtle sequence boundary now will be not as subtle uh right because of the of the rebound of the shelf and you when you clear all that weight of the of the sea ice from the top of it you're going to have a lot of scouring surfaces because of the movement of the of the ice to the shelf uh, that will also enhance the the unconformity. So in that case, sequence boundaries will be easier to see. Uh, um, uh, flooding surfaces uh, could be a little bit more tricky, right? Uh, so uh, um, my my advice is still to follow. Uh, at, at the end of the day, the game is. What are the faces that you have? And doesn't matter what uh, how sophisticated the terminology that uh, the local sedimentologists are using for their glacial uh, sediments. Put them from proximal to distal. 
put those faces from proximal to distal and look for Walter, right? Walter's law. <laughs> right. Walter is always there. <laughs> Just look for Walter and uh, and see from proximal to distal and uh, and see if it makes sense when you look at a core or an outcrop. Uh, if you see that uh, variation from proximal to distal also has a vertical stacking uh, showing uh, progradation or retrogradation, but then within that uh, uh, glacial environment. For instance, I'm, I've been playing more and more of carbonates and, and, uh, and, uh, and the carbonate folks, they love their nomenclature for faces too. And each one, there, each one of them is completely different and more and more curious than the other. And uh, so the first thing I do is say, folks, just put this thing from proximal to distal for me. <laughs> and, then, and then I can play. <laughs> right. uh, so Walter is, uh, Walter is your friend, try that. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I know we're we're running over. We do have one more question, Vitor. If you're if you're willing to take that, and then we'll wrap up after that. And this mm -hmm. is from uh, um, Khalid. Do you want to yeah. ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. I worked on the uh, Miocene of Cyrenaica, Central Mediterranean. Uh huh. Yeah, and uh, uh, the Middle Miocene everywhere in that basin is transgressive. Except. Mm -hmm. It shows me shallowing all the time because we have tectonic uplifting mm -hmm. transgression mm -hmm. and it was like an island. So I have yes. to face on labbing from both sides on that island. Yes. And my scene is showing, the middle of my scene, showing shallowing upward all the time, vertical mm -hmm. like a wall, and never shows the deepening pattern as I mm -hmm. see in, the, in the middle of my scene in the middle. Yes. So it was, yes. it was it was a dilemma there. It's all shallow, from uh, red algae, uh, subtidal to oolitic, uh, awesome. lagoonal species. Yes. Yeah, the middle might seen always a problem, like to show the deepening, always showing shallowing. Because well, but uh, but uh, th that's the cool thing, uh, Khaled. You were already answering your own question. Uh, you you nail it. So the fact that uh, you have uh, an overall glacial static rise during the middle of Miocene, uh, because you have local strong sediment supply, the sediment supply is over overwhelms that uh, overall glacial static rise locally, right? So, the, so you, you solve your own question. So uh, it, it, that's the thing, the observations, uh, the, uh, the basic observations, they win, right? It doesn't matter what's uh, happening in the world, you know what's happening locally, right? So locally, despite of the fact that you are uh, in, a, in a time that you have an overall rise in, 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 in a relative rise in sea level, uh, uh, your local high sediment supply overwhelms that. So when I put, when I put like the symbol, it's deepening, though it shows shallowing. Is that okay? Like, well, it depends, depends, depends what you want to, to demonstrate, right? So uh, in my case, I, I follow the basic observations. Uh, what you described to me is a progradational package. So I have a progradation during the middle Miocene because you have a strong sediment supply. That's it. Thank you. Appreciate it. I, oh, I do you. love that. I, I do love the when when you stick with the observations, then you literally and of course you have to do them in you know time and space, right? And exactly. your comment about you know one liners will kill you. You got to map it out. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Is yeah. what I tell all my folks at Rise too. Is that uh, uh, the reason why the company pays you the big bucks is to to make maps. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can you, you can evaluate the progress of here by how many maps you did in a day. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. So it's you know it's it's that observational approach that then allows you to get past some of the no, nomenclature confusion and just be able to talk about those observations and then to be able to project that into a predictive sense, right? Because there's an expectation of what you would see up dip down dip you know, lateral along the way. So it's, it's incredibly powerful. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, you spoke like a chief. <laughs> well, that was my past life. So. <laughs> With that, Vitor, 
Christopher, thank you so much. Uh, oh, thank you. Fascinating presentation, as you can see, you know, a lot of interest because people kind of hung around even 30 minutes after our, our end time. Um, again, this presentation was recorded, so it will be available on the uh, HGS's YouTube HGS Geoeducation channel. And if you have questions, I did post in the chat Vitor's email address. Uh, we also have that at the HGS website. Part of this is to make connections, so um, get in touch with him if you have further questions. And thank you all so much for, uh, for joining us tonight.